Unspoiled Network Podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Mage Errant Book One, Into the Labyrinth, Chapters 14, 15, and 16. Entering the Labyrinth, The Deeps, and A Fateful Choice. In these chapters, Dan is the one who decided what chapters I was going to read from week to week. And I uh, just want you to know, Dan, that I feel a way about where you chose this section to stop. And I'm really eyeballing you quite hard, sir. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much, Dan, for commissioning this episode, but also, I hate you. <laughs> I don't get to record again until Tuesday, and I will be finding out what happens. I'll be reading before Tuesday, I promise you that. But it's just a very mean-spirited thing to leave me on this cliffhanger until next week, where I get to talk about it. Very rude. Dan says, I do it by page numbers, not cliffhangers in my defense. Defense. What was I going to say? I was going to say defense, take a rest. Trying to do like a kind of play on defense rests. That doesn't really work. But you get what I mean. <laughs> you understand the tone I'm taking here. Um, yeah, this was, I, I just want to give you guys an overview of my feelings just in general here. I am genuinely kind of shocked at how fast this book is moving along. And I don't know why, because like, I'm looking at how many pages or how many chapters we've got left. And there's only four more after this. So I should have realized that this was going to start like getting down to the point here this quickly, because otherwise, what did I think that we were going to be waiting to go into the labyrinth in the second book and not into the labyrinth in the book called into the labyrinth. Honestly, I think I maybe did sort of think that because a lot of books are not named what they, what is in them. A lot of times they name like the implication of the book overall. So anyway, the fact that we already go into the labyrinth in these chapters and how much happens here where they wind up? I, I figured something was going to occur to cause them to drop further down, but I was really expecting it to be like their mistake. I didn't think it was going to be an accident that forces everybody down in a way that they would never have pursued themselves. This is just like a side effect of some shitty magic by a dude who is not being careful and it just the whole way that this goes down, didn't see it coming. And I also want to mention, because I had, you know, posited the theory that we were going to be seeing a creature with whom he was going to have to consider making a deal because he has this, he, he ripped the ritual for how to make this negotiation out of the book and put it in his pocket, or he put it in that other book. And I was like, yeah, all right, that means you're going to use it. But the way that it goes, uh, all of this is is surprising. And I really am hoping it's better than it looks. Because, like, if he's got to make a pact with a demon after everybody was very, like, anxious over the fact that he was going to make a pact with a demon. And... It seems, and I may be wrong, but it seemed like in that scene, Alustin wasn't really defending demons. There wasn't a, there are some good demons kind of argument coming from him. He just sort of kept saying that, don't worry, that's not what Hugh did. And I can't tell if it was because he knew that nobody was going to believe him if he said there were some good demons. If he felt like, well, there aren't any, so I'm not going to say that. Or if it was like, 
if I tell them there are some good demons, they're going to view me with suspicion because that's like a very sus thing to say. And they would begin to doubt my judgment in everything. I don't know. But overall, the fact that it looks like he is going to have to make a deal with this demon to keep his friends alive. They are, they are on the, they drop into the sixth level, right? But they're in the fifth by the time this section ends. This is not the kind of thing where like, we can just call a teacher and, and get them to get us out of this. It is mentioned that people don't come down this far unless they have made preparations and are really like ready for it. I have to assume that none of the teachers and professors that are up there were anticipating anybody being anything like this far down. So they probably don't have things ready and at hand for this eventuality. So either they're going to take a while getting down there because they're not prepared to do it, or they're going to take a while getting down there because it's so far that even experienced wizards who are prepared, it's a fucking labyrinth. That's the way that it works. Like, I just don't know how much they're able to sort of sidestep things like that. And then my other question is the fact that the floor of that secret room was not spellbound to keep it from cracking I can't tell if that is just a function of the labyrinth because it kind of seems to want to kill people. And if it was just like, oh, yeah, so in this room, we're going to make it so that if you like try anything, you just fall through the fucking floor because fuck you. Or was this like a setup of some kind? And I don't even mean like, you know, I don't mean roads, but Hugh drops into a spot where there just seems to happen to be a demon chilling who knows his name and wants to make a deal with him. And I am kind of uh, eyeballing this demon here. Like, did you make this room to get this to happen? Because like, I don't know how much control any of the creatures in the labyrinth have over the labyrinth. I've been kind of assuming none, but I also don't know what the fuck the deal is with a demon. Like, I don't know what they can do. I, it, you know, so all that said, it could just be that it was an unfortunate coincidence. It, it may even be a fortunate coincidence if I want to get really optimistic about it. But a part of me was kind of being like, oh, right, this feels like it was all put together somehow. And I have to be perfectly honest here. I have gotten to a point with my consumption of stories. This is books, television, movies, everything, where I have a really ambivalent attitude about whether or not something was set up from the beginning. Ambivalent meaning actually ambivalent leaning towards negative. What I mean is I used to be pretty impressed when it felt like everything had been orchestrated from the beginning and I didn't find out about it until later. And it all was part of the plan all along that it would go this way because somebody was like in charge of it. And there were times where it felt like that was just sort of either retconned in a way that didn't feel like believable in stories that were otherwise a sloppy mess. And they tried to act as if they had thought it all out. And it was like such a, a clear lie that it was like, come on, guys. Or there are times where it's like a, a character is such a mastermind that they figured out what every person would do along every step of the way, really. Like they could almost see the future. That's how it was because that's how it feels sometimes where you make somebody like so good at manipulation that it's almost a superpower. And that can feel a little bit like OP, you know? There are times, though, when that kind of thing works and works really well. It just has to be that you first genuinely did get it planned from the beginning and you're not retconning because we can tell 
And it also needs to be, I like it personally when things were set up, but maybe didn't go according to plan. And so it wasn't that they like predicted every step of the way. They predicted a few things and then they like rolled with the punches when things went a different way. And uh, I just, so I, I am leaning towards that this wasn't a setup, but I wanted to mention that it, it, it did occur to me. And I prefer if it's not, I think, but I, I won't be mad if it is, as long as it's like done well, you know? So anyway, I just wanted to mention that because like, there's just a, a part of me these days that has grown to be suspicious of so many plot beats that otherwise might not have gotten my attention a few years ago just because of the fact that like, oh, he only got arrested because he wanted to be in jail because this is all part of his big plan has become such a thing. And I kind of feel like it has in some ways made me have less fun with consuming stuff because I'm like waiting for little like twists like this that aren't even there, you know? So I, uh, I, I want to fess up sometimes about the way that media has like rotted my brain. Um, Miss T says, I thought it was a labyrinth driven trap, including the demon part. Oh, that didn't occur to me that the demon was like going to be part of the threat that the labyrinth was lobbing at them. And then the demon was just like, um, I know that you want me to like kill them or whatever, but I'm just going to sit here and have a conversation real quick. Dan says, I like the in-between when it's more someone has a plan, but is smart and skilled and can roll the stuff out of their control. The Emperor Palpatine type. I'm sorry, Dan, but I can't support Emperor Palpatine after Rise of Skywalker, which was one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. The line, somehow Palpatine has returned, will live in infamy in my, my fucking chest forever as one of the laziest I swear to God. I Don't get me started. Don't get me started. I'm not even going to talk about it because it just makes me so angry. It gets me so mad. Dan says, what's that? Star Wars ended at episode eight, right? If fucking only. If only. Okay, look. I am going to talk about it. I swear. A minute. Less than. In. in my opinion, The Rise of Skywalker is like one of the number one worst movies I've ever seen. And it is because they walked back so much. It was the most cowardly thing I've ever seen. And they lowered the amount of lines for certain characters and stuff. They like completely cowed to this very vocal, bigoted minority. And The Last Jedi was a fucking beautiful masterpiece that I adored. I loved it. And they just absolutely shat all over it. And if you are a person who says that you don't like Last Jedi and you like Rise of Skywalker, I don't like you. That's it. I said it. There is too much baggage attached to everything that went down with Last Jedi. If you don't like it, I have a problem with you because there's just there's a lot of implications to that. And that's all I'm saying. And I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Ha! Look at that. Miss T says time. I think I got it. I think I got it. Um, but yeah, there's like very few things that are such popular pieces of media that I can be like, if you think this is good, I think that you're, you might actually be a bad person. A lot of times I just try and be like, I think it's trash, but people like what they like. Then there's things like this where I'm like, no, no, I'm pretty sure that if you think that's bad and another thing is good, that you're actually like something's wrong with you as a person. So <laughs> Miss T says, I said time, ma'am, you're right. I, I, I just had to, you know, I just had to cap it off. I just had a little, put a little outro on it. Um, so, OK, back to this. <laughs> oh, oh, God, I'm sorry. OK. So 14, this is honestly really shocking. And I don't know what to think here. They're at the, 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 you know, gate, so to speak of the labyrinth. And there is a woman who is in charge of this whole thing. And I find it really fascinating, you know, in once again, making comparisons to Harry Potter, 
how many students there are at the school and how many like teachers and professors there are and how because there are so many there are plenty of folks that they go up and talk and Hugh doesn't know who they are and uh it was sort of a weird thing where there, it, it's not like there weren't professors at Hogwarts that we never met as readers. Cause there's one that I know Hermione goes to for like rune like classes. And uh, we, I don't think ever even set eyes on that teacher, to be honest, but I, th that's like still as somebody who went to a sort of, I'm going to say probably fairly small high school. My graduating class was like 250 kids, I think. That's pretty small, I guess. Um, even teachers I didn't have, I knew who they were. And I had I, I at least would recognize them. This is a school so big that there are tons of students he's never seen before. And teachers that he straight up does not recognize. And... The kids later that get chosen to be the second team to go in have these incredibly bonkers body mods that the fact that they don't they they don't like ring a bell is wild. Like what kind of of what is your day like if you're walking by? people who have fucking tree limbs for arms and are covered in scarabs and shit wires that glow embedded under their skin and they don't like stand out particularly amongst all these other people you just don't even notice them like that's just wild to me you know what i'm saying um dan says my high school had 5500 students yeah, I guess that if mine was like 250, we had like, I guess, yeah, about a thousand. So yeah, your school was way bigger than mine. Uh, Ms. T says, Hugh isn't in advanced classes. He stays in the library. Nevertheless, I would be in whole, in the whole, like going from class to class and you'd see people in, you know, I know that he has been kind of uh, isolating himself, but it, it, there's just to a point like you can't avoid everybody all the time and it's just to me quite an illustration of how big the school must be and how nuts a lot of folks must look if the, that just never really hit the radar and they haven't really been talked about evidently you know nobody was like have you seen the guy with a tree limb for an arm he hasn't at least heard about this because it's like evidently this common it's not common because they stand out like when he sees but you know what i'm saying it's just very the the mental image that i keep having of this school i have to adjust continually because it is just a much bigger school than I imagine in my head automatically. Um, so he's sitting there and is like, all right, well, they're going to be picking teams to go in in order of who is the most capable, which means that we'll probably be near the back because we have a notorious like lack of skill. And the ones that go in first are going to run into more monsters and stuff. And when he gets called there first, the, their group is the first group to go in. And I don't know what to make of this because I know that they have gotten more skilled, but I didn't expect anybody else to be aware of the fact that they had gotten more skilled. I thought this, like Hugh says, we have to prove ourselves. So what the hell? Like, there's a part of me that got very suspicious about this. And then later, there's a mention after they get to the center, which is not the end of it, because then they have to get back out again. After they get to the center, they've talked to a couple other teams who mentioned running into like a lot of traps and, and other monsters. And I was just like, they seem to have gotten off kind of easy with some of it. Why is that? You know, considering they went in first that's sort of weird, isn't it? Like, why would that happen? Um, and I'm sure we'll get some sort of explanation for that. But it's just really 
compelling to me. So yeah, Hugh almost falls over. They have to go like move over there. And then the second team is called. And this is when he sees like these wild looking people. And Hugh is saying to uh, Sabe, these people should be going first. They look like complete badasses. And Sabe is like, hey, dude, um, I'm covered in scars. She's covered in tattoos. Godric is just giant. We are not all that, like, unimpressive ourselves. And Hugh is like, well, I mean, you guys are, but I'm not. And Sabe says, yeah. And don't you think that's making people wonder what the fucking deal is? Like, these are folks that all have body mods that look really significant. And then there's you looking like a normal person, but you're mixed in with us. Everybody must be wondering what the fuck you're capable of at this point. And I get what she's saying in terms of like his rep, but because he doesn't have some of the like offensive abilities that they do in the end, later on, he starts to get really agitated about what he can contribute, which leads to him deciding that he is going to do something fairly dramatic and I can't even be mad at him for it, but we'll get there. So the doors open, they go inside and right off the bat, they have to decide which direction they're going because there's like a few different places they could head towards. And uh, they have like a plan on what's going to, you know, who's going to be out in front. Of course, Hugh still has his like secret project, which we wind up finding out is a sling that comes with a bunch of like warded little stones. It's a very Usopp vibe to me. Um, those who don't know what I'm talking about, that is a One Piece reference, which I am also covering. And he only has 12, which my first response was kind of like, I know you've been working hard and I'm going to just assume that you couldn't possibly make more than 12. But sir, 12 is not enough. That was my immediate reaction was like, only a dozen? That's really not going to do it. And it doesn't. It doesn't. And he also didn't really think through how he was going to access them in a, like emergency situation because he just puts them all into the bag on his belt and there's other stuff in there. So he's like digging around for them a couple times and like, you know, it's difficult to find them. And, and I just kept thinking about there have been a couple times where uh, I have this like huge, very thick canvas apron that I've been wearing out into the yard when I go and deal with the puppies because they have very sharp claws and they will jump up on me and I trim them, but they grow back fast and they will claw the shit out of me right through my leggings. So I have this apron and there have been a couple times where I have the like treats that I brought in the apron pocket and I grab one to give to one of the dogs. And of course the others begin to absolutely lose their minds because they see that he got a treat and I didn't have all three in hand. So now I'm like digging in my pocket past a million other things, trying to find the other two treats while the other two dogs are just like completely flipping out. And that's not even a like life or death situation. That's just a like immediate kind of frustration situation. And it's very flustering. And I just really felt for him here because I understand there are things that you get so focused on a certain aspect of it that you overlook the more practical aspects sometimes and how it's going to work in the heat of the moment is certainly a thing that you're not going to really know until you try it, which is a problem. So they run into some imps have to go down with their, uh, their, all of their weapons to begin with here. We've got, um, <laughs> Hugh does use his, like one of his little ward stones, but it's not until Talia yells at him to do something. He had literally just been standing there watching. Um, and Talia is using her very cool, uh, abilities, which we see even more of later. And they are wild. And is proving quite effective, actually. Um, Godric smashed his sledgehammer down, pulping two of them. Sabay kicked one. 
releasing a gust of wind that sent a whole crowd of them flying backward. So he uses, he spins, he strikes the floor and there was a lot of energy stored. At least a half dozen imps were caught in the blast. They weren't just killed. They were pulped. So like, that's pretty, you know, I understand that it may feel like, yeah, I needed like a little gadget to do this, but nevertheless, you you handled more than one at a time. It was very effective. So I want to give him some credit for this. And later on, when he's like thinking about what he has contributed to their group, he doesn't think of this moment at all. He thinks about the fact that he saved their lives when they fell, but this part doesn't come up in his head. And I was sort of like, dude, don't you remember? That was actually kind of, you know, you need more of these for sure. But I wanted him to, uh, I was expecting him to be able to do more to protect them in terms of using wards as shields during the fights. That was what I was expecting based on what his abilities are and what I thought his like special project was going to be. Um, I don't know what that would look like, you know, an object that he throws in front of them when, when he uses the sling and he fires this thing and it explodes and pulps them. I will admit I was surprised because I kind of expected this thing to hit the floor and then create a shield and basically make it so that they can like attack the imps from behind the shield, but they will not get hit. And the fact that it was really much more of an offensive spell surprised me because I felt like that's not him leaning on his strengths, you know, and I don't know if maybe he's falling into the same mistake. I had said a little while back about how interesting it was that we have a main character who's really good at wards, which tends to be something that side characters are good for in a lot of stories. And I'm wondering if Hugh has sort of had that same like mental, well, I'm not useful for anything unless I can actually fight. And while he, he has found a way to cope with that and do something that can cause harm, which is helpful in the moment, being able to shield your partners from harm who are really good at the, offensive part of this is extremely useful and contributing a lot. And I don't know if that's just not something that's possible to do with what he knows about wards or if his imagination just hasn't really like turned to that direction yet, but I hope he starts to think about it. Um, and I love to, they get all covered with like this I core from the, uh, the busted up imps and he just digs out the the enchanted rock that Godric made for him to get rid of the smell and they use that a bunch of times because a lot of these monsters are stanky just nasty um so they didn't find many traps trip wires dart traps and non-fatal pitfalls were supposed to be common on this level but they only found a single dart trap which hit godric right in the backside much to the other's amusement especially talia's and a coughing gas trap which that sounds truly awful to me anything that makes me cough like coughing is just such a vicious bodily motion your whole self just like contracts and you can't talk. You have trouble breathing. Sometimes you'll be in the middle of like sipping something and you start coughing and now you're almost drowning. And then after, if you cough a lot, your fucking like ribs and abdomen hurt. Coughing sucks. I hate it. Um, But yeah, this whole thing is not as bad as they were expecting. And I'm just, I'm just of a suspicious mind. And I feel like that is suspicious i'm just saying um so they're the 11th team to get to the center which considering that they didn't run into that many traps is sort of weird you know like if you're not running into that many and you were the first in you would think that they would be out here sooner than a lot of people but no and i had like i got really surprised when it was like oh and then they reached the center because I had forgotten that they have to get back out again. So I'm like, oh, wow, 
all right, so they already passed. No, they've got to leave. And if they don't get out with their token, they have to come back and get another one. And each uh, token is like specific to the student. So other teams can sabotage you and steal your tokens and fuck it up for you. But if they lose their token and steal yours, it won't work. They will still fail. They have to keep their own token and fuck things up for you. Um, I was really surprised that's not what Rhodes goes for. I guess Rhodes got distracted by the fact that they were all mocking him, which was truly just so great. But I thought his first attempt like to fight them was going to be to take their tokens and was genuinely surprised that didn't seem to have occurred to him. Um, so <laughs> the first thing Hugh is like, I have a good feeling about this one hallway and he goes down it with his friends and then they get like chased Indiana Jones style by a giant boulder, which literally like corners and follows them still. Um, and <laughs> eventually Talia is just like, yeah, okay, next time we uh, hear you say like, oh, my gut's telling me this, we're going to do the fucking opposite of that. And then they start passing this wall and he was like, something's weird about this. And he stops and he can tell that there is actually a door here. And Godric says that his dad found his enchanted hammer in the labyrinth. And all of a sudden I remembered Cradle Labyrinth and the whole situation with that. And I was like, oh, I didn't even fucking think about the labyrinth and cradle and the labyrinth here. Like, but there it is. Um, and so Godric is like, maybe there's like awesome shit behind the secret door. Let's do it. They go through and here's Rhodes with his people. And Rhodes says, look what we have. A worthless sheep herder, his two whores and a dumb brute. Now I want to mention Earlier in this, there like the the first chapters when it's described how Rhodes and his cronies came and trashed Hughes's room. It's mentioned that they pissed in his bed, and uh, I immediately kind of noticed that that language is a little saltier than what I would expect to see in a lot of other YA, and then. There was another word that is used earlier and I can't remember what. And I was like, oh, OK, there it is. And then here him calling them whores. And I was genuinely taken aback. I'm not mad at it because like kids this age talk like this, like kids swear, you know, and use bad language and, and slurs sometimes because they truly like don't get it a lot. But it was a bit arresting. I was like, oh, I didn't know we were going there with it, but okay. Um, so he says that and Hugh is starting to like panic a little bit. And Sabe, because of course Talia is like, all right, I'm going to fight this guy. And Sabe says, really? That's the best set of insults you can come up with? I'm going to have to give it a solid D. The sheep herder bit, you've used often enough. And it clearly gets to Hugh, but calling us whores, that's just lazy. And calling Godric a dumb brute, you should see his homework sometimes. We go to him for help more often than not. No offense to either Hugh or Talia, but angering them isn't exactly hard. Especially not Talia, Godric muttered. So, if you'll excuse us, we'll be going now. We've got a test to finish. You're not going anywhere unless I say you can. Really? Yes, really. No, I was asking if your banter could get any more boring and unoriginal. You really have depended on your position more than your wit, haven't you? What do your cronies think? You there with the blue hair. Are you actually that impressed with Rhodes insults? The twins, not sure who she was referring to, looked at each other in confusion. Rhodes, standing in front of them, didn't see that and seemed to assume that they were being silent because they couldn't make themselves praise his insults. He turned bright red. You can't... Were you about to tell me I can't talk to you like that? Which normally would be followed by me telling you that I just had. And then you demand by what right I dared to do so and so on and so forth. Let's just skip all that, shall we? We have better things to do. Talia started laughing. Rhodes' glare snapped to her. You damn, were you about to call her a barbarian, Rhodes? This is Hugh. 
he chimes in. I was like, word? Or maybe a ginger bitch. Spay's right. You're really pretty predictable. And Rhodes is literally starting to like become incandescent with rage. It's he's losing it. And he's saying you you worthless. And then his spear comes at Hugh. And it stops. Now, I just want to say. This is attempted murder. Right? Like, Rhodes was going to try to kill Hugh. This was kill him. Right? I really want to know what Rhodes would have done if Godric didn't stop him. Genuinely. Like, what would you say? Everybody in that room is a witness to what's going on. You can't just pay everybody off or rely on your name. Rhodes, buddy, what are you doing? But Godric stops it because it turns out that the one of the attunements road. Rhodes has is wood. They think it's metal um, steel at first and that's how he's controlling the spear which is like floating but it turns out he is controlling the wood of the shaft of the sphere and because Godric has a steel attunement he is able to stop it in midair and overpower it because I guess that's like the front of it and that's also heavier. Um, I don't know exactly why he has more power in, than Rhodes because one would think that the wood with the shaft being much bigger than the spear head would probably be the like attunement that would control it better. But uh, maybe maybe Godric's just better at controlling than Rhodes is like overall. I don't know. But either way, it turns and begins to head back towards Rhodes. And he ducks out of the way and completely like lets go of his control and then unleashes a bolt of lightning at them and sabe literally catches this bitch in her fingers it's burning her it's fucking her up nevertheless and she chucks it at the floor and then the whole room basically shatters and they plummet and the next chapter begins with Hugh crafting a spell as they're falling of a way to like save them all because it's really unclear how far they're going to fall, but better safe than sorry. And all I could do in this moment was imagine the scene being played in like, you know, movie style of very slow motion as everybody is falling through the floor and will like thinking out the spell the way that Robert Downey Jr.'s Sherlock would think ahead how he was going to attack somebody in order to incapacitate them. And then just like actually putting that into motion. Um, and I am in, I'm very into it. Like he really tosses aside later the fact that he did this. This kind of on-the-fly magic has been ex ex expressly said to us by multiple characters now to be particularly difficult. And we're talking seconds. And he manages to put so much into it that he saves everybody from death. Literal death. And it also, like, pulls so much mana out of him that he has a moment of just being like, Wow, I don't think my levels have ever been quite this low before. That's crazy. And I was just thinking, like, I wonder if anybody else could have pulled this off because his mana levels are unusually large. And evidently the spell needed that. So I feel like he was the only person for the job that we have met so far. And I might be wrong about that. Like, I know your mana, like, pools apparently grow as you grow so it's possible like older wizards could pull this off mages um is there a difference like because he's a warlock 
is that is there a difference between mages and and wizards is that a whole other thing as well or is that not a factor in this like they may mention warlocks but never mention wizards i can't remember if they have yet or not um dan says they don't really use wizard at all in this series okay I keep thinking it in my head, and I guess that's because of, like, the Harry Potter invasion in my brain. But, yeah. Uh, mages just means you are a magic user. Okay. So, he manages to save everybody, and Rhodes gets himself the fuck out of there immediately as he realizes that they have dropped past the first floor. He really panics. And it's... uh you know, Rhodes is obviously actually a coward, but I found it funny a little bit how it, I know he's a coward just because he knows what potential dangers there are down here, but it really felt for a moment like he was just like, oh, we'll get in so much trouble, which I know Rhodes doesn't actually give a shit about and that's not what it was about. But for a minute, I was just seeing him as like a little bit of a goody two shoes. But yeah, he rescues himself and then leaves them there. And uh, they had gotten instructions earlier. Like if you see a student, at, even the, if they're at the bottom of like a really short ramp going downward and you think you could just go help them, do not do it. Go find somebody and tell them. And the the moment that he leaves, Hugh says something like, maybe he'll tell a teacher we're down here. And everybody looks at him like, bruh. And he's like, yeah, I know. Um, so he bails. And this is when the demon shows up. And this guy sounds ugly. The demon was surprisingly similar to the imps they'd come across on the first floor. It had a bat-like face hairy protrusions all over its body, and arms that were disproportionately long, ending in razor-sharp claws. In addition, however, it also had a long, hairless prehensile tail, ending in a stinger. Some sort of black ichor dripped out of the tip of it, sizzling when it hit the ground. Hate that. Really hate that. The demon's most notable feature, however, was its gut. It protruded outward grotesquely, with transparent skin showing its intestines. They resembled nothing so much as a squirming mass of tadpoles. Okay, no, 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 no. I don't like it. This is a this is a hard no for me. And he says, "No need to be afraid, Hugh. I intend you no harm." And I was like, "Yo." I don't know what your deal is, man, but do not address somebody who should be a total stranger by their fucking name and think that's going to reassure them because that's just going to wig them out. And it also says that he smiled in what was probably intended to be a reassuring manner, but the mouthful of fangs it revealed did quite the opposite. So this dude's name is Bakori, and he's like, I've been watching you. And, uh, I'm really sorry about how my spawn have been behaving, but they're not intelligent or polite. And this is part of what made me kind of wonder, like, is, is he respond? Like he might be part of why they didn't run into more traps. It might be that sending these spawn out were like activating traps before they got to them. You know, who knows? Um, and he says, I bear no ill will toward the Academy or its residents, despite their antipathy toward my kind. And, you know, a creature being like, people are just bigoted against everybody of my race. That's a real quick way to like pull my heartstrings. And I feel like I'm a sucker, but I don't know. I want to trust this guy. It's just that he looks so demony. I'm not going to lie to you guys. A lot of this has to do with appearance. Not proud of it. So he wants to make a deal. And Hugh says no. And all of his friends are really the ones who say no first. And he's like, yeah. And Bakori is like, all right, well, you uh, are going to have to go through this level, the sixth level, by the way, without any help. And I'm pretty confident you're going to need some. 
So say my name three times and no matter where you are, I will shut up or I will shut up. I will show up and we will revisit our negotiations. So they begin to move and they find this uh, room full of statues. And I'm like, of course, these are definitely going to be statues that attack them. But they're not only statues that attack, they're like really hard to stop. There's a sort of when I imagine trying to fight creatures that are made of stone, while they seem extremely like heavy and hard and like they would deliver really brutal, blunt force trauma. I also picture them as being somewhat frail and like brittle and they are but they can get back up again and like keep coming at them the way that zombies do. Like unless you get them in the exact right way and really take them out, they just keep picking their asses back up off the floor and continuing the assault. And I was just really unhappy with this entire like situation. Godric manages to make them a, uh, ladder out of stone but they have to hold all of these guys back while he does it and Hugh is once again in a position of feeling like he can't really contribute all that much um so the, I, I I'm running out of time so I really I want to spend more time talking about this but really what it comes down to is that there are a couple injuries sustained here. And one of them is Sabe has like a uh, twisted ankle. She's not sure if it's broken or, or sprained, but I think we all have heard that a sprain can be even more painful and like more awful to deal with than a break. So that sucks. Um, and just the situation already feels like they went through one big obstacle and they are all fucking wiped like they're so exhausted they have used up so much of their power and uh i was genuinely like this feels like they're really out of their depth in a way that's genuinely worrying you know so we go to chapter 16 a fateful choice they've just managed to get through the statue room they are taking a breather essentially and godric has to make a stone cast and a stone crutch for sabe and they're heading through and godric is looking around like this is sandstone that shouldn't be this far down and later they come across stalagmites and stalactites and he's like those don't happen with sandstone and everybody's just like look godric get over it <laughs> nobody's really interested i felt kind of bad because he keeps pointing stuff out that people are just like and and i was like honestly godric i i sympathize with your pointing out things like this but it's magic can we all just like agree like at one point uh talia just says it's the labyrinth and that's kind of the only explanation. And everybody's like, yeah, I guess that's all you got to say. So Hugh comes across a skeleton and there is a sort of like medallion around its neck that he takes. It looks like it's got almost like the labyrinth on it. And I'm like, that feels like a sort of mapish thing. I wanted them to hold it and look at it while they traveled a little bit more but they don't do it he puts it away and uh this is the moment where hugh goes up to talia and is essentially like what you did with your dream fire against the the statues was fucking insane and a regular fire mage would not have been able to f do anything to them because fire and rock like it's not gonna yeah and uh she seems really like t touched by that so they start coming across bones look at the bones and there's a couple ways out and he was like i'm i'm saying we should take the smaller one and everybody winds up agreeing with him and then all of a sudden 
this like swarm of something comes out of the big exit and it's a bunch of weird like crab bees wasps they're weird it's a whole weird thing and they take them out fairly easily but it is followed almost immediately by a seven foot tall one um Talia launches a dream fire bolt, which dissolved halfway to the crab. A bitch is worn out. Sabay and Godric readied themselves, Sabay charging up wind mana in a rapidly constricting sphere around her fist, and Godric readying his hammer. So Hugh has his sling, and he sees a like weak spot, and he's like, if I need to hit it in, like, if I need to do real damage, I need to hit in a weak spot. And he fires and he is like miles off. I kind of appreciated that because like becoming super accurate with a sling takes a lot of practice. That's not just going to happen. You know, Um, I find it kind of odd that he chose a sling as the firing mechanism. Like, I feel like there has to be a better means of doing this, but I don't know, maybe not. Um, And there, like it's a bay. She's not really affecting anything. Godric's hammer crunches down on it, but it gets him in the leg. And this is so awful, you guys. So it gets him in the leg. It's standing there. And Talia decides that she is going to use her bone attunement. And I forgot she had a bone attunement. And I was sort of like, I wonder how that would even work. Because I kept thinking about it as a sort of healing thing. Like if you break your leg, maybe her bone attunement can be used to mend your leg. I don't know that still may be true, but here, what she does, this is so cool. The bones beneath the crab began to grow. It looked like flames made of bone were rising out of the scattered bones on the floor, but at close to the speed of an arrow shot. The flame-shaped bones impacted the base of the crab's carapace. They pierced the shell in several places and actually lifted the entire crab off the ground. Godric was lifted as the crab's leg rose until the crab's leg slipped out of his thigh. And it she stops so that it's like caught in midair. And I'm thinking that's where it stops. But the bones are glowing. There are like cracks forming that are glowing. And Talia is like, get Godric out of there. And they don't get far enough. Godric literally throws himself on top of Hugh. And then when the explosion is over, Hugh says, you can get off me now. And Godric didn't say anything. And I was like, hello. He he didn't say anything. Oh my God. Like all of a sudden I was like, is this a book where Godric dies? Like, is he going to do that to us? Is that going to happen? I all of a sudden realized, I don't know anything about what is uh, this, the the language has been just salty enough that maybe we're going to have characters die. And that had never entered my mind. And all of a sudden I was like, uh, I, I'm really not sure why I just assumed that's not how it was going to work. But it's really scary. Genuinely, I had a moment of like, <gasps> and Sabe uses her healing attunement for the first time. And manages to like force out a lot of the bone that embedded itself in his back there's a really big chunk and she is like helping to knit the flesh together as well it's not a complete heal he isn't like you know back to normal he's not 100 percent back in fighting shape but he's able to breathe he's not bleeding as much it's the kind of thing where it looks like Maybe he looks as if he's had a few days to heal, you know, and it's going to take months really to fully heal, but he's on the mend here. And Sabe is like, I can't believe I did that. And Sabe and he was like, dude, you saved your friend's life. Do not be ashamed of that. And I found that kind of interesting because, well, all right, I'm going to wait until later. So everybody is so exhausted at this point that he finds a particular cave that looks like it's a good bet and puts them all in there and just like everybody rest. And they do, they like pass the fuck out. 
he is so wrapped up in self-loathing over the fact that he didn't help as much as he thinks he should that he decides he's going to do a bunch of other labor here to sort of make up for that. And he gets rid of a bunch of the egg sacs that are in this lake. He uses something to test the water and it's not poisonous. And so he fills their water bottles up again. Um, he has like light cantrips that he has set up all over the place. And it, it just overall piling bones, trying to make the, the area that they're in defensible in case something were to happen. And uh, all he keeps thinking is that he's worthless, that he hadn't been able to help his friends, that the wardstones he worked really hard on were barely effective and that he didn't think through how he was going to use them. Just overall, he felt like dead weight and he starts crying. Finally, he decides that he is going to do something. And he unlatches his spell book and begins to call to the demon. And what I think is interesting is how Hugh has this, like, you know, the possibility of making a deal with a demon was obviously the first thing that his friends thought of when they heard the word warlock right from the gate. And he had to assure them he had never done that and... Alustin had also had to assure them this as well. And he has a sort of shame, I think, around the concept of that as a possibility even. And Sabe has that shame around using her healing ability. And, you know, she used it to literally save her friend, but she's still sort of like, I can't believe I did that as if that were a bad thing. And she has to be reminded yeah, but you saved someone's life. Like, what are you talking about? And I'm sort of wondering about that with Hugh. Like, he's about to make this deal. I don't know if this is good for him or not. But I guess the difference is, Sabe using her healing power, I don't know how much using it affects, like, her attunements in general. It Does it have any lasting effect? Because, like, him making this deal is going to have a lasting effect unless it doesn't. I don't know if he can like team up temporarily. I don't know what kind of like deals you can make. Actually. I've been thinking that whatever kind of pact he makes is going to have to be something permanent, but maybe it doesn't have to be permanent. I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Well, I don't know, but I do know one thing. I am out of time. So I am very excited to keep reading and find out what the fuck, because I am assuming they get out of the labyrinth by the end of this book, but maybe they don't. What if they don't? What if they didn't get out? What if the book ends and they're still fucking down there? That would be a hell of a cliffhanger. I gotta say, I would almost respect that. Part of me kind of wants that in a way, because like the, the overall labyrinth situation is super cool, but I'm sure it would get tiresome. So probably they should get out. Hmm. I guess. All right, fine. I'll allow it. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I'm going to wrap up, but thank you again, Dan, very much for commissioning this episode. Appreciate you a lot. Hope y'all are enjoying listening until next time. Toodaloo motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.